I'm interested in catalysis and who got All right, but I gather, I gather your main objective is to get a, a feeling for different people's uh, getting into catalysis yes. and how their life developed. Yes. Uh, all right, uh, actually, my telling you about my involvement in catalysis ties in with somebody else that you interviewed earlier today because my interest in catalysis was uh, to a large extent influenced by Michel Boudard. Uh, all set? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, I come from South America. I was born in, uh, in South America and uh, grew up there. And so the first time I came to the U.S. was in 62. And so in the early 60s, my first exposure to the, this country, anything away from home, was Stanford. And there were two professors that I became quite close to uh, during that period of time at Stanford. Uh, one was uh, Michel Boudard and the other Andy Akrabos. But Boudard quickly had quite an influence on me in terms of uh, guiding some of my undergraduate work. And uh, I spent uh, more and more time with him and so and this was also right at the time when Stanford had, uh, when Boudard had, had joined Stanford, 63. So I graduated in 66 and by then I was really a, a good friend of Michel's and also influenced by some of his thoughts of what are interesting areas to work in. My uh, family is in the chemical business and so I had a uh, a reason to um, to be interested in chemical engineering to start with, which was uh, one of the reasons I came to the U.S. to get a chemical engineer's degree. In trying to choose a, a field within that, uh, the influence of a, of a professor like Boudar was certainly important, and so pretty much by the time I finished my bachelor's degree, um, I was committed to move into the let's say the, the chemical engineering aspects that deal with, chemi with surfaces, with uh, reactions on surfaces, and catalytic phenomena, or at least related phenomena. Uh, it was uh, thanks to Michelle's uh, guidance that uh, I ended up going to Princeton. And um, I spent uh, some time in Princeton with the idea of getting a PhD. Now I had to leave Princeton uh, after my uh, first year because my father passed away so I went to run the family business in South America which got me involved more and more into into chemistry but my ultimate aim was to get a PhD in chemical engineering and so when I decided to come back which was two years later I asked Michelle if I could come and join his group so that set the course definitely the course into catalysis after getting my PhD I again uh, influenced obviously by Michelle's uh, guidance, I went to Exxon and worked at the corporate research lab. But by then my interest in catalysis had been quite fixed. Um, I had two reasons why it attracted me. One, because um, it had very interesting scientific aspects, but also its commercial implications were obvious. I mean, anybody, anybody knows it. And uh, it was that commercial pull that uh, attracted me uh, all the time, and in fact, it was strong enough that uh, after a few years at Exxon, and after continuing to talk to some of my friends and colleagues, including Michelle, uh, the idea came up that we ought to try to start an enterprise on our own that was based on catalysis and the further development of new catalytic systems. So that's how the idea of uh, Catalytica came up. And uh, it was in uh, the early part of 74, in a conversation with Michelle, that we really thought that this would be something that we should go for. And uh, we got Jim Cusumano involved, and the three of us uh, slowly developed uh, the, uh, the details of starting a company. And Catalytica was started in November of uh, 74. So, Really, uh, from that point on, uh, catalysis was our theme, and uh, we decided at that stage that we were going to uh, basically stake our, uh, our careers and, in fact, our future. And uh, at that time, from the standpoint, and in particular of Jim and I, anything we owned, because we didn't have too much money at that point, 
in setting up a business that would build eventually into a company that would produce uh, important innovations and catalysis, commercial innovations and catalysis. And that's how the, uh, the course of, uh, of our first thoughts in Catalytica started. You may know the story of Catalytica from there on. Uh, we uh, uh, decided that we really couldn't seek funding at that point in time, and so we wanted to develop um, our own company on the basis of building it basically uh, through consulting and contract research. But our aim always was to have an opportunity to develop our own technology. So uh, the first decade really was establishing a foundation. First of all, proving that a small group can really do something on their own. Uh, proving to larger companies that there was a reason for them to, uh, to get involved to uh, seek our help, to actually engage us in helping them solve their problems. Uh, and by the early 80s, we had a fairly sizable research team, had a nice research laboratory, and we're doing work for a lot of companies all over the world. Very interesting life, uh, a lot of contacts, a lot of travel. But it was still not satisfying from the standpoint of feeling that we were really harvesting our own ideas. Uh, and so in 83 we decided we were going to shift into uh, a more risky level of uh, activity which was to develop our own technology. So we did that, we obtained funding in 83 and 84 and since that time we've been developing catalytic uh, chemistry with the idea of making an impact in some of the processes that uh, could use new catalytic systems. And that's what a catalytica is right now. Uh, what is the biggest contrast personally between working at the big giant Exxon and mm -hmm. starting out on your own? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, one of the things that uh, a, a company like Catalytica offers is that it, uh, in a way, it removes all boundaries. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. It just uh, unfolds a magnitude of possibilities that we could really never have before. Uh, that is not to say that uh, one can't have a very good, exciting, and productive life at Exxon. And uh, the years I was at Exxon were very good years. And I learned a lot there, and I hope they feel I contributed. But uh, there was a set structure and a set organizational framework that imposed some boundary conditions on how to do things, how fast to do them, how aggressive to be, and also, by the same token, on the feeling of how much of an impact I personally was making on the company. Uh, so to then jump into a situation where we are uh, really, in effect, staking our own ground, um, uh, making moves that have a profound impact on ourselves and our company, uh, which is much riskier, but at the same time has a level of excitement and potential future reward that is of a different magnitude. So it, uh, you know, it's really more of a feeling of the impact you can have and the fact that the world is wide open. You're shooting out there and uh, you know, you get uh, knocked here and there, but you can keep moving in a direction that gives one a very substantial satisfaction of having a deep say on one's own future. But at Exxon, you at least have a security parachute that you're not going to suddenly fall. Uh, how long did it take you to get over the fe loss, feeling that you'd lost that security? Well, uh, I would ask you, uh, Parenthetically, uh, is it really that secure? I mean, the, the, well, not anymore. <laughs> the history of the recent times uh, shows differently. But certainly at that time, in fact, when we uh, started Catalytica and when we left Exxon, uh, there was a, uh, it was a, a, not an easy period for chemical engineers in general because uh, the oil crisis had hit and uh, uh, people thought we were crazy in moving away from, as you say, the protective umbrella of such a large organization. The strange thing is that 
we never really thought about it. That aspect, you know, we were so driven to make something on our own that the possibility of that kind of a downside didn't really enter our thinking. That doesn't mean we didn't struggle. And for the first period, uh, there was no such thing as salaries. And, you know, I mean, we really hung in there. But there was, the, there was something inside that said, well, we're going to give it our best shot. Now, to be fair, we, uh, both uh, Jim and I, who started the company, had a, a fairly good reputation, and we had good confidence that we had skills that were valuable. So it wasn't a situation that we would, uh, that our families would be destitute if um, things didn't work out. But certainly the trauma of moving families across the country, because we moved to California shortly after forming the company, and the uncertainties uh, are things to reckon with. Uh, but we just, you know, felt that the excitement of what we were doing more than overcame any problems. And we were able to attract some very good people um, to come and join us in the, in the task. Uh, one of the things, of course, that is an important element in that is that we, uh, because of the whole concept of Catalytica, uh, we offer the opportunity for everybody who's an important player in the company to be a part of the company, to have shares in the company. So there is a definite, a much closer connection between one's efforts, success, and one's participation in it. By the same token, there's a closer connection in the other direction also. Ooh, what were uh, your biggest obstacles you encountered in the first two years? The first two years, the hardest part was really to drum up business. Uh, 75 was a tough year. We were fortunate in getting um, a couple of contracts with uh, either government agencies or groups similar to that, the Electric Power Research Institute. And uh, at that time, it was IRDA. Uh, gave us a couple of contracts to, in the case of IRDA, to help them look at some of the uh, challenges they were facing as they were looking at the oil crisis, challenges in terms of catalysis. Uh, similarly, we worked on catalytic problems for EPRI. Uh, that helped. And that was, to me, very important in terms of recognizing that that was from a financial standpoint, something that helped us in that early period. But we knew that that kind of work was really not why we had uh, left uh, a, an industrial organization. We, we wanted to do industrial things. We wanted to have an impact, a direct impact, not just a, uh, a, uh, an impact of a critic. We want to have the impact of an innovator. So that's why our aim was always to work on industrial problems. But the first two years was really to uh, get uh, get business, to get people to listen to us. Uh, it was you know, a lot of cold calls. Just uh, can you call the switchboard and find out the name of the vice president of research and say, sir, this is who we are. We'd like a few minutes with you to tell you that we can uh, have something important to contribute. And uh, it slowly picked up. Once you do that a few times and you start getting a few clients, and then they repeat business, and then word of mouth gets around. So by the time '86 came around, we were really in a much more, a much smoother operation. The other thing we did in '86, we uh, conceived of uh, not an innovative thing that had been done before, but not the way we slanted it. We felt that there was a niche in producing some high-quality, uh, deep, and uh, uh, very uh, intensive assessments of status of catalytic technology and speculation on where the future of that of particular areas would go. So we started a, a catalytic a studies program. And uh, that is the one aspect of business that we're still, of that business that we're still doing. We don't do any more consulting or contract research because now we're just doing work where we have a significant stake in the commercial future of our research. But we still do multi-client studies, and uh, that has been uh, a very active, uh, uh, of active interest in, in around the world. It gives us an opportunity to be in touch with a lot of companies, and they benefit from cross-fertilization, from getting a sense of where the forefront of the science is. And so that's been very good. 
that started emerging in 76. So towards the end of 80, 76, we started really seeing that that was a viable additional aspect of our business. But basically, 75 and 76, the main problem was to make sure we, we were viable, to survive. Um, and then to start attracting people. Uh, Bob Garten, with whom you talked, he came quite early in the game. He came towards, I believe, the end of 76, early 77. Ralph de la Beda came actually at the beginning of 76. So we really started our little nucleus from which we grew to the company we are now. Well, uh, I don't know if you know Leonard Drake, who developed the mercury porosimeter, but... Uh, I know of him. I don't know him he, personally. He sent me a page out of Forbes, or a couple uh -huh. of pages, uh, when they had written up Catalytic, and his question was, what do you know about these guys? Uh, how did that getting in Forbes and breaking into the business world come about? Well, we actually, uh, subsequent to that Forbes article, had an article in Fortune magazine, too. Um, well, there was uh, several reasons. Maybe the most uh, immediate one that led to it was a, uh, when we did our financing, we put together a very unusual uh, partnership that uh, started becoming somewhat of a landmark in, in many of these uh, investment partnerships that... Uh, subsequent to ours were put together. And uh, that caught the attention of the financial community. And also the fact that we were, and still are, the first group to try to stake out an industrial presence by founding ourselves on invention and discovery and staking, in fact, the future of the company on our commercial success of our inventions in catalysis and in the chemical industry in general, but certainly the catalytic aspects of the chemical industry, that is not uh, common. Uh, there are no other companies like us. And uh, I think a lot of people, both in the industrial world as well as in the financial, financial world interested in the chemical industry, are watching to see how things evolve. Because um, we have succeeded, I think, well to date in terms of the quality and size of the company, the power that we have on how we work together, uh, some of the innovative thinking we have, some of the people associated with our company, like Henry Taube and Jim Coleman. I don't know if you know, but Henry Taube spends half time at Catalytica. Uh, all of that is really means that we have a, an extremely effective and powerful innovation machine. And we've been working on some interesting systems and have been learning how to manipulate catalytic systems at a molecular level and thus enhance our ability to come up with breakthroughs. Uh, but the proof of the pudding is going to be when we have our first commercial process out there. So, you know, there's still a road to go. And I'm sure a lot of people are saying, well, let's see. Let's see what, <laughs> let's see what happens. How do you break that bond from the motivation to continue your thesis work and do pure research to one where you're directed mm -hmm. toward using research but yeah. doing it in a much different way and mm -hmm. for a much different reason. Uh, I can only speak for myself and for me that was relatively easy to do because of my background. My family has been in business for generations and uh, they are Germans who escaped during the war. Uh, German Jews and uh, they were in business in Europe and when they escaped with basically nothing they went to South America and started again and so one grows up with that sense of uh, being in the business world and I ran my family business for a few years so it was in me that sooner or later I wanted to do something commercial I, I like science very much it, it, you know some of my most intense and happy periods were when I was really deeply involved with, uh, with my PhD work and uh, uh, academic pursuit. But uh, inside me, I know that, for me at least, uh, the commercial uh, transformation of what one has intellectually into something that, in fact, creates value and therefore a return is really the name of the game. And so it wasn't that difficult. The most difficult thing was really to uh, move, actually, and you hit it in your earlier question, to move from an environment where 
uh, the problems were narrower and better defined, academic environment, exon, to a situation where everything is a challenge, from deciding how to do some mass mailing, to hiring, to firing, to organizing a company. I mean, all of that, uh, you know, that's, a, that's the multiplicity of what you get, legal aspects, financial aspects, accounting aspects, management. It's all part of, of building a business. That's very exciting, very different from just the scientific pursuit. Well, many scientists uh, branch out from their original intense tunnel area research, but they usually go into philosophy. <laughs> Do you see yourself going into business as being an analogy to that? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I'd call it analogy, because uh, going into philosophy really is a, it's a different uh, intellectual domain. But it broadens much more your view of yes. what you're doing. Yes, and in a way, in order to succeed in business, there has to be a philosophical foundation to what one does. In fact, that's essential to uh, being able to drive a company in the right direction and to harness a, a good team. Uh, a sense of purpose and a sense of uh, conviction, a sense of, um, of uh, a vision, a dream, and something you want to go to, and then, you know, of course, you need a superb team to put the pieces together and also to help you shape the vision. But there is a philosophical aspect to that, especially if you think about the fact that we are our company is patterned after what I like to call, it's just not my term, it's uh, been used before, but it's really a third wave type company. We are an entrepreneurial group, uh, employee participation in the stock and in decisions and the whole atmosphere, is a creative atmosphere, is the atmosphere of some of the more, um, some of the companies you see in this valley, for example. Uh, the third wave companies, something that uh, uh, Toffler uh, wrote about, but maybe in a different context. Um, and that's our vision, and that's what makes us comfortable, and that's what we're excited about. But at the same time, we're working in a second wave industry, a, a very well-established industry that has been around for a long time. And in a sense, doing what we're doing in that industry is kind of exciting, because the philosophical aspects of trying to prove, even effect, that an entrepreneurial, let's call it third wave group, can be a innovative force in this very important long-term industry. That's exciting. And it's, it's maybe somewhat parallel to what the uh, early days of the semiconductor and, uh, companies and some of the computer companies were doing to revolutionize uh, communications and to revolutionize uh, uh, the, the whole uh, computer industry and so on. It was uh, really a bursting forth of a different way of, of uh, looking at things uh, from what RCA and GE and these companies have been doing. Now, those companies have either uh, uh, formed liaisons with these new groups or uh, somehow absorbed some of them to create their own stimulus. And I suspect that's going to happen in our case too. These, uh, we, we are for sure going to be forming special relationships with the larger companies that have the markets, that have the commercial need that we are uh, solving or that we are offering. So that combination has its philosophical aspects and in order to overcome all the bumps that one inevitably finds in a, a road that we have chosen, it's almost essential that you have to keep such a philosophical overview to, uh, you know, to see that you're still moving forward. Uh, did you have any role models that uh, you, you would say, this is what I'm trying to do or I'm following, or is this something that you have the idea and then you go out and create it on your own? You know, that's been probably the hardest thing for us. That if you look around, there is no uh, specific 
model that we can follow. We can't very easily look at a company next door or, you know, in the other, in another city and say, ah, I see what they did. Yeah, that's a good idea, let me do it. Or even when we're doing certain things to have some reference points that gives us a sense that we are on the right track. There is none. And that loneliness, if you will, is maybe the most difficult thing we face. We are, we're trying things that haven't been tried. Uh, we're trying forms of management that are new to our industry, to our group of our way of thinking. Other people talk about it. I'm not trying to say we're something fantastic and novel. But just trying to do this in an entrepreneurial environment like we have is a departure from the way new discoveries and developments have been done in the chemical and petrochemical industry in the last 30, 40 years. And so we just have to try it and, and, and have some gauge that, in fact, our movement is up. And not having a reference point is the most, let's say, straining to our patience and our perseverance. So it's a very, you have a very incisive question, and it hits to a core that we have uh, often pondered. But that's the way it is. And, uh, uh, you know, if we make it real big, then we can look back and say, right on, you did it right. If we don't make it real big, we sure as hell gave it a good <laughs> try. And that's, you know, that's the situation. Yeah, I guess uh, Exxon can compare themselves to Mobil and say, how did we do with them that year? But right. you don't have someone, right. unless you look back to, let's say, someone like Houdry in the 30s who was doing something unique in catalysis. Yeah, there was, in the, sure, in the early days, there was a lot of real entrepreneurial uh, spirit. Um, those were not as complex days, although I'm sure that they were, they were feeling just like we are feeling right now, that they're in a new world trying to do some new things. Uh, you see a lot of computer companies springing up, a lot of uh, even biotechnology companies. They have models. They're, they're in the computer industry, the financial systems are worked out, and it all works. A computer company that starts knows that uh, from the time of innovation to discovery and commercialization is a period that fits the framework of expectations of the funding sources. So you have venture capital, they put money in, and you, you eventually go public, gives them the return, the growth in the sales fits, employees know that they see to the, the other company and say, hey, you know, a couple of years, they go public, wow, that, that works. We're really in a, we, we, are, we are looking at that and we're trying to draw things from that framework to try to uh, adapt it, if you will, to what we're doing. But we can't look there and say, hey, there's another catalytic, and yeah, sure, they did it in this period of time. So we're close. We've, uh, we've been at this now for our proprietary work. We've been doing that 85, 86, 87, maybe three years full time before, after we quit all our consulting contracts. And we can say, well, almost did it in four, four and a half, five years. We're getting close. No such reference point for us. So whether we are close or not is strictly a matter of our perseverance. And in retrospect, we'll be able to talk, but not in prospect. That's a, that's a tough one. How do you, uh, well, if you will, get your report card each year? What do you grade yourself on? Or is this something that you just have to leave to the innovative uh, intuition and mm -hmm. have some faith? Yeah, uh, you have to have some faith. Hi, Robert. How are you doing? Yeah, give me a few more minutes. All right. Thanks. Um, you have to have some faith. In fact, we should quit because i got to get going. But let me just answer that. You have to have faith. Um, you know, it's a challenge to keep a company like this uh, funded, uh, if you want to talk about challenges. And in a sense, you have one scorecard by being successful to attract funds to believe in what you believe and help you get there. But that's not enough, and, and we're getting to the point now where uh, there is an increasing need to, uh, to see our commercial realization. Very important. And uh, the success will come really as we move forward in how effectively we move from the early innovation to the, through the D 
and into commercialization. We have one process that is currently being piloted, but it's a very big process. It's going to take many years before that piloting really uh, demonstrates that it pans out. So even there, we're not nearly at a point where we can say the commercial reality can be tasted. We can see the reality coming out, and we see how when we run into problems in our research, we put our intensity into it, we try to become as systematic in understanding what's wrong on a molecular level, and we solve our problems. And that gives us a boost. But uh, given that we have no reference point, the scorecard is really just a belief that we're going to make it. And, that, and, and a, a hard look at what have we done, and what's been wrong, and what things ought to be cut out, what ought to be changed, because uh, we can't afford a lot of uh, mistakes along the way. Some will be made, but we can't afford many of them. Which is the toughest, the technical or the people problem? <laughs> um, I, let's say that people, I, I'd rather not call it people problem. Let's say the, the people challenge is a key challenge to make sure that the technical innovation progresses. So they're very closely linked. People are not motivated and, and working together. It's unlikely that you're getting the most for their efforts. Uh, the technical challenges, the fact that you don't know really when you're going to have the breakthrough. Those are very difficult too. You cannot plan to have a discovery tomorrow. <laughs> you can just establish the best environment, make sure you're working on worthwhile problems, and go for it. And that, uh, that's hard to measure. What does go for it mean, and how far have you gone? It's a balance between the two, and I would say both of them are key challenges. Well, I was uh, born in uh, 